if i can make you more involved with my conversation then i think i'm doing a good job and you know i learned all of that because i've been watching wrestling for so many years and i'd been sort of it it had just been seeping in you know it was all of that information was seeping in Hi Mahi, welcome to the Sports Fish show. How are you doing? Doing really well. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to uh, all the questions that you have for me today. I'm very excited. So let's start with the MJ show. We see uh, we see it in see it in the backdrop as well. Um now the MJ show is your own IP. It's something that you yeah. produce, you host and yeah. um, as I was going through the episodes, I couldn't help but notice that um you've had a lot of guests from the sports space so there's been um someone from the sports science space uh there's yep. been someone from the sneaker space in sports which is such a niche in the sports industry but it's uh, it's yep. a mammoth of an industry it's got its own fan base so it's a very specific yep. topic but very few people kind of try to cover that um so yep. i couldn't help but wonder do you yep. have a deeper connection with sports You know, I think uh, as a kid, uh, I used to play a lot. I mean, uh, during my school days. But unfortunately, the reality in India is most often kids are told like, "Okay, you got to focus on your studies. It's not about sports. It's not about music." So what I'm doing right now, professionally as well, is a complete anomaly. Considering that 17, 18 years ago, I actually finished my engineering. I'm an electronics engineer. Huh. But yeah, even while doing my engineering, I used to sing. I used to perform. I used to play badminton I used to play uh, football so mm-hmm. you know I was always into sports I have always loved basketball but never played it at like a professional level but played it in college and played it in my in, in your, you know in my uh, home area and you know with my friends and things like that so I was always into sports but never into it to a point where I could say that okay I am a sports person while you know okay I I converted one of my passions into my profession which is music because what I do right now even with the MJ show if you notice while i've had a few sports people uh, primarily it's been music industry the the entire music industry of india has been uh, pretty much a guest on my show i mean everybody from the top most singers like sonu nigam shreya ghosha sunidhi chauhan to young singers who have uh, you know who made a name for themselves arman malik amal malik all of these you know the the entire music industry has been on my show but i've always loved sports and mm-hmm. i think my deepest connection right now with sports is my love for professional wrestling and you know for for sports entertainment as it is called you know wwe so that's the one space that i have been able to sort of go uh, technically professional in because you know now i'm doing commentary for wwe as well but my love for sports was always there and the, the last thing that you mentioned which is the sneaker space is something that i I have just fallen in love with right now it's been so uh, you know as you can see i'm sitting in front of my comic books right uh, on the other side i've got my statue collection and on this side i've got my movie and music collection so my mm-hmm. living room is like a uh, is a testament to all the things that i love my mm-hmm. wife has been kind enough to let me <laughs> sort of usurp the living room and put all the stuff that i love in it but sneakers are something that i'm just getting into and i think it began with the last dance documentary mm-hmm. when i saw michael jordan's documentary and i actually saw this shoe it's such a strange coin i i don't know why i kind of felt you got to bring this up which is why i've kept this over here <laughs> apart from being a sneaker it's also in my opinion a part of history it's a part of uh, it, it's a, it's it's genuinely i look at some of the sneakers as art because they've got such an amazing story behind it mm. there is of course you do want to wear them it's not like i'm going to keep it over here i'm i'm going to wear it i'm going to rock it everywhere but the point is there is such amazing uh, history for these shoes there is such a, a, a you know such a crazy fan following yeah. for uh, you know everything that goes with the sneakers so you know when i thought that okay I'm, i'm getting into sneakers like i do with anything i want to research as much as i can i want to really know so that you know if somebody does talk to me and i say that hey i like sneakers i should be at least able to hold a basic conversation about the history of sneakers or why do i like sneakers with them so as i went deeper and deeper into all of that i found some channels on youtube which i really found fantastic like you know they were getting into not just the 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 design element and the you know the aesthetics of a shoe but the history of the shoe mm-hmm. and why why a specific sneaker has a historical significance you know when when did it really capture people's imagination and one of the guys who i thought was one of the top content creators in this space is a guy called jack slade So I said you know what I'm going to reach out to him uh, and have him as a guest on my talk show because when he talks about sneakers he's talking about sneakers but mm-hmm. I found that every content creator 
has a story of their own why did they get into that like why did he start making videos on sneakers and i wanted to find out about that so i got him on we had a nice chat and you know it's it's been a fantastic journey getting into not just sneakers but into all these things that are a part of the basketball culture because the sneakers mm. space is very very closely connected to the basketball space and now for the last couple of years i've been getting deeper into nba as well so i've enjoyed this whole process you know it's it's all mutually connected it's the music that goes with it it's yeah. the it's the lifestyle it's the culture and of course then the sport itself Yeah absolutely I think you touched upon it really well I, you you've got to be on one of the uh, hopefully India sneaker cons down the line um that that'll be you know uh, I I can see a perfect fit fit right there uh but you mentioned WWE um that's something yes. that is uh, very interesting uh, please tell us a little bit about your role uh, how you got started how's that experience been so far So you know uh like I told you I'm one of the few people in the you know who can say that I've converted all the things that I love into mm. a profession or at least if not all the things a lot of the things that I'm really passionate about I've been able to convert that into my profession I've been a I've been a legitimate hardcore wrestling fan for over 25 years now I mean I just turned 40 10 days ago on the 15th of March and I realized when I looked back at it like oh man I've been watching wrestling since I was like 12 or 13 something like that mm. so i've been following wrestling for over 25 years and uh, i've loved everything about it from the pageantry and the over the top characters the storylines to the in ring action and uh, you know i've always found the business of pro wrestling of sports entertainment uh, incredibly fascinating i think even before i got affiliated with the company in any form whatsoever i always thought that man this guy is a genius vince mcmahon who basically created you know what we now know as modern sports entertainment yes he he's just a brilliant guy and i would love to have been part of that world in some way and i did not think that that would po- be possible you know living here in india and everything related to wwe happening in the us but then about 7 years ago i think it, it was at wrestlemania 30 that uh, and of course wwe has a presence now in india as well and they started doing small live events where you know they want to do like a fan meet up and you know watch wrestling events mm. or you know when their superstars would come down to india there would be like mm. a a fan interaction where you know it would be at a mall uh, a big event happening at a mall and there'd be like 2000 3000 kids coming to see their you know favorite superstars so i got introduced to the guy who was essentially uh, running the events and everything for wwe uh, in india 7 years ago and he said okay let's start off with one and i i hosted wrestlemania 30 that was the first event that i did it was at a hard rock cafe here in mumbai i was on a big screen they were showing wrestlemania i was anchoring in between all the matches uh, connecting with the crowd and he realized that this guy really knows stuff about wwe because they had created a script of sorts or questions to ask and i don't think i really referred to that at all he just said okay you got to keep the crowd engaged and i did that like way i mean much beyond what the script required me to do because i really knew the stuff and i was yeah. a fan who was also a professional anchor i mean i was anchoring for 10 years 11 years before that but i was also a fan of the product so i knew the product so well that anchoring became very uh, easy for me mm. and uh, before this i had about 8 years of experience doing radio so again talking as you can evidently see comes very naturally to me so when they started bringing their superstars down to india they said you know hey why don't you anchor these events as well so not only would i interact with the crowd for say like 45 minutes before the guy came on stage but then i would when he came up on stage i would interview him again that goes with my strengths of being an interviewer on radio because as a radio radio jockey or a radio dj as they are called uh, outside of india i had interviewed over 300 artists on radio as well mm. and the mj show was on at that point of time as well and i started doing video interviews as well so you know talking to people came very naturally so you know he realized i mean you know the the wwe team realized that okay this guy can also host our live events with our superstars and it's not awkward it's not weird the superstars feel comfortable with him so you know that sort of elevated my presence in the company even more and people the indian fans started realizing hey we've seen this guy before and he's come for this event and that event so you know eventually i did about 4 years worth of events i think about 12 or 13 superstar visits that had happened to india i was i traveled with them and i would host the events over there and then about 3 years ago in april 2018 uh i started working with sony again you know mm. i was introduced to them and they realized that okay this guy really is a fan so he knows the moves he knows what's happening he knows the history of all these superstars so you know i genuinely believe that to be a sports commentator it's not just enough that you like the sport 
but you really need to know the sport like you need to know the uh, you know the the technicalities of it you if, for instance if it's wrestling you need to know the difference between a figure four leg lock and a choke slam or you know mm. i mean okay these are very simple names that i gave you but you know even within submission moves what is a specific submission move called can you add a little bit more can you give it some more color by saying that oh this was invented by this japanese wrestler in the 80s or whatever you know that just makes the conversation for a fan a lot more interesting when he's listening to that commentary he's like oh wow man i'm getting to know a little bit more apart from seeing play by play so mm-hmm. play by play is just like where i say oh now he punched him and now he's going to throw him out and he's now going to pin him and get it, get the 1 2 3 mm-hmm. but if i can make it more interesting by giving uh, you know some references to history if i can tell you the specific name of a, a, of a move or if i can say oh you know when this move is put this is what happens this is what the the guy who on whom that move has been put is probably feeling right now if i can make you more involved with my conversation then i think i'm doing a good job and you know i learned all of that because i've been watching wrestling for mm. so many years and i'd been sort of it it had just been seeping in you know it was all of that information was seeping in and then when i did become a commentator i got even more serious about it started making notes and started preparing stuff so that you know every time i go for commentary and then i don't need to carry notes with me because mm-hmm. a lot of it is already in here and you know whatever i need i can just refer to it in some form or the other and that was the that was my connection with 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 wwe you know i got to go from being a fan to mm-hmm. being an anchor for their live events and now my voice is being heard by thousands and literally uh, possibly millions of people here in india because in india hindi commentary is heard by pretty much the same amount of people who are wanting to consume the content in english so you know mm. while all the urban kids might be listening to the commentary in english you know the the same footage that comes from the us we are simultaneously broadcasting hindi commentary so it's mm. it's literally like if you switch channels the same action that's happening in english is happening in hindi at the same time so we don't have a script i mean i'm not going off a script of any sort we are looking at the action and we are calling it live and i think there's a huge amount of population in india which is genuinely enjoying watching this content in hindi because they are understanding it even better hmm. they are able to connect with the superstars and you know with the action a lot better and that's been fantastic i mean despite me being primarily comfortable in english now i've been doing this for 3 years in hindi yeah. and i'm loving every minute of it yeah no that's very insightful uh, but since you mentioned you know english and hindi commentary you're mainly doing it in hindi but you've also hosted a lot of behind the scenes additional content in english what is yep. the difference in tonality between the two languages when you're hosting it how much of your style changes when you're hosting it in two different languages how much of regionalization localization do you have to bring in so you know um it's a very interesting question it's it's when you're doing commentary whether it's hindi or english your tone will change what i mean by that is uh, if for instance if michael cole is doing commentary and michael cole is doing an interview he is going to sound different or if cory graves is doing commentary and cory graves is doing a podcast or if he's doing an interview he's going to sound different because the moment you're watching the content the moment you're watching action you are involved in it like if you are a fan who is also a commentator you are involved with everything that's happening like when a, when when you see a massive punch happen or you see a drop kick or you see a spectacular move you know you like talking about it right now i've got goosebumps because i know what what i feel when i watch a really spectacular match or when i'm doing commentary for a really great match you know i'm not just sitting idle like i'm i'm moving my body is moving i'm jumping you know if something really exciting happens i'm i'm standing up you know it, the whole body gets involved when you're doing commentary i and especially like if you're doing a 3 hour event if you're doing a 4 hour event or even if you're doing a 2 hour smackdown your entire body is engaged in your speech now the difference between speaking right now the way i'm talking to you right now my entire body is not engaged i'm not projecting i'm having a conversation with you i know that through my microphone you can hear me clearly and i don't really need to sound like you know uh, i'm i'm screaming out to you out there but when you're watching action you are involved in it it's got to feel 
uh, a lot more vibrant than just a conversation. Because imagine if there was a live match happening in front of me, and if I just spoke like this. So right now, uh, Randy Orton and um, uh, you know uh, AJ Styles are fighting with each other. Randy Orton is doing really well, and I think he's uh, he, he's he's kept control of the match from the very start. AJ Styles is a high flyer, but I don't think he is going to be able to compete with Randy Orton today. Now, if I did this, I would not get the same reaction as. If I did this, I'm going to move the mm. microphone back a bit just to give you an idea mm. of how I would change the tonality. Okay? Oh my God! I cannot believe what's happening. Randy Orton is about to hit the RKO, and it's going to be incredible. So I'm just just giving you an example. I would not say yeah. those words, but the point is that would be my action. You know, that would be my mm. my tonality because automatically mm. I want to engage. You know, I think commentators, especially for for wrestling, are an important element of the show. you we are the ones who are telling that story which a fan is enjoying because if you've ever been to a wrestling event where it's happening live in front of you if you go to an arena event like if 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 you go to a wwe event there is no commentary okay there is no mm. commentary happening in the arena if if it is being shot for television the commentary is happening only on the microphone and that's coming straight for television but all the if there are 15000 people in that arena well not right now because of covid but uh, otherwise if there were 15000 people in the arena uh, they don't get to hear what the commentator is saying and their enjoyment of the show is very very different from the enjoyment of the person watching it on television and i would gen- genuinely say that somebody watching that same content on television will probably enjoy it more than the person sitting in the arena for multiple reasons of course if you don't have a front row seat if you're sitting somewhere right in the rafters you're probably seeing the wrestlers this big right you're not really really getting to watch them of course you get that joy of saying that i was in that arena when that magic moment happened but then you are eventually watching that magic moment on the big screen which is put in front of you you're not yeah. really watching the action in the in the ring unless you like i said if you're sitting in the front row or the for, front 10 rows you know and where you yeah. can actually see them up close but otherwise if you're sitting up there you're just watching it on some big screen so essentially you're watching it on television but with the television on mute you're not getting the commentary you're not getting the action that you get when you listen to your favorite commentators calling the action and telling you oh my god this was incredible this was phenomenal like if i did that in hindi what i was just doing it's mm. even more animated because i know that our audience is here they love that theater they love the drama that we bring with our voices and you know it's our responsibility to make them feel that uh, at the end of a 3 hour session uh, you know a 3 hour episode of raw or or, or a wrestlemania or a major uh, pay per view that happens i want the audience to be able to have conversations about what they heard oh my god mm. like if if 10 people were sitting together as friends and watching it they should be able to say like oh, whether they like me or they don't like me or they like my other commentator or they don't like the other comment there should be a conversation about it because if you're not talking about it then we've not done our job or if you're not talking about the action that you that you saw they have not done their job that is the superstars they definitely deliver they always deliver in all these big shows so it's our responsibility as commentators to be able to deliver just as well you know because if we are not doing our job we kind of leaving them uh you know half way you know like they they've done mm. their part by doing that crazy action and doing the flips and the kicks and everything else so we it's our responsibility to take that story that they are doing on screen to the people through our voices right so so essentially what i'm gathering from this is also that the the narrator or the commentator or host yeah. is very important sort of driving the narrative of the show Absolutely. sort of adding an element and adding to the show versus sort of um you know just being on the sidelines you're you're actually the driver you're captain captaining the ship there 100% yeah 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 and it's always been that way like whether you know you go back in time if you listen to all your favorite english commentators who've done professional wrestling yeah. uh, from everybody from Vince McMahon to Jim Ross to Jerry Lawler, uh, Booker T, uh, Corey Graves. Right now, uh, you know Michael Cole. One of my favorites was Mauro Ranallo, who did a commentary not just for NXT but for uh, various other combat sports. All of these guys had a very distinctive style. You remember their voices. You remember the stories they told. Like you know when uh, you know that iconic uh, match between uh, uh, the Undertaker and Mankind, where Undertaker throws him from the top of Hell in a Cell. Uh, when he falls down every fan in the world remembers jr's voice saying oh my god he's dead he's broken in half or whatever those specific lines were i mean i don't remember i have a bad memory so i can't quote it verbatim but we all remember the 
the energy that he had or in the attitude era every time women superstars walked out and mm-hmm. you know uh, jerry uh, you know jerry lawler would get very excited his his voice would get high pitched and he would be you know these were all uh, distinctive sounds from my childhood which i still remember right now because they were the voices that shaped my uh, understanding and and viewing experience of wwe mm-hmm. and for me uh, i feel super excited about knowing that maybe 10 years down the line some kid will say that you know uh, especially some kid from india will say that you know what my sort of growing up and my uh, visuals were connected with mihir joshi's voice doing a commentary for wwe that's a that's an incredibly thrilling and incredibly uh, satisfying part of what i do as a wwe commentator but yes as you said it's very it's a, it's a very important job especially for uh, wwf especially for sports entertainment you could probably watch a tennis match on mute you could mm. probably even watch a cricket match or a football match on mute and not really miss out on much like if you're if you're in a sports bar for instance okay there's music playing or whatever else but they've got the football match playing you know united playing against arsenal whatever everybody is watching the match and they're not really missing out if the commentary is not maybe the one point where you really want the commentary is to see the excitement when a goal happens you know and and you know the the commentator's voice or you know whatever or if some important moment happens that's when you need the commentary but you don't need the commentary for 90 minutes you can right. live without commentary but you cannot live without wwe commentary for like a 3 hour show you right. cannot watch it on mute it's just not the same experience yeah. no ultimate form of sports entertainment so uh, yeah absolutely drives the point home uh, but I have to ask because I mean I've sort of uh, produced my own show. I'm hosting my own show. You've done it multiple mm-hmm. times. You've been doing it for years. Um, so mm-hmm. not just as a commentator, but also as someone who owns his own IP. There is yeah. now such low barriers to entry in the market, right? Tools yeah. have become accessible. How right. does one still differentiate themselves? How does one make them unique? Find their own voice and style. You know, uh, like you said, right now. literally every kid with a phone even if they don't have a good microphone or whatever they can start their own talk show especially now during this lockdown uh, i've been inundated with requests for from you know kids who started off conversations you know because everyone sitting at home getting bored thinking okay what do i do now let, let me let me talk to whoever is who whoever i can get and you know have a conversation with them let's do an instagram live and then you know you, you so there's a difference between Uh, all of that and then a legitimate talk show now what what differentiates all of these kids who are doing it and i'm not dissing anybody i, I love the drive i love the fact that everybody is wanting to create content and a lot of them are doing a brilliant job at it as well and you know they will keep getting better and it'll come to a point where you can think of it as a talk show or as a legitimate mm-hmm. podcast of sorts but um, what's the difference between steven colbert doing a talk show and a kid uh on instagram doing an instagram live the difference is the years of experience that go into uh, creating a space where the guest feels comfortable mm. you know it's not just about my ability to talk it's about my ability to get a conversation happening with somebody who may not necessarily always feel very free or open when he or she is talking to a reporter or a journalist okay mm. because as an artist now like i said you know i i fall on both sides of the of uh, you know of the track because i'm i'm also a singer i'm also a performer you know i i have a band uh, and so there is that that artistic aspect of me and then on the other side i'm the i'm the host i'm 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 the talk show host who's interviewing a lot of other artists but what 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 i bring to the table is since i know the other side i know how i would want to be interviewed hmm. i know how i would feel when i'm asked a certain question how would i like to be talked to i always apply that to my guests on the mj show and i make them feel comfortable where they know that okay hey we are not just talking to a journalist or a reporter we are talking to a a guy from our fraternity he is an artist too you know he i'm i'm, a, I'm at home here i feel comfortable so that is in 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 all of the talk shows that you love you know all the international guys whether it's a jimmy fallon a kimmel uh, you know um, steven colbert james corden they all have a relationship of sorts that they've built over years of years of experience and getting to know the industry and they are a part of the industry as well where somebody like a tom hanks 
can sit with a Stephen Colbert and he can have a great time. You know, he can just basically chill out and say that, hey, man, Stephen's my friend. I'm going to be chatting with him and uh, I'm going to have a good time. Because, you know, yeah. he, he knows that, okay, this guy knows me. He's not going to, he's not going to ask me something stupid. He's not going to make me feel uncomfortable. This is home space. I can do that. Mm-hmm. And all of these guys build those relationships. So for what differentiates, you know, newer content creators from older content creators, because at the end of the day, whether it's a talk show, or whatever, we are all content creators. We are creating content, whether it's for television, for YouTube, for Instagram or wherever else. I think it comes down to experience. It comes down to uh, your ability to make yourself interesting. There is no, there is no formula. Like if anybody asks me, Hey, how do I become a talk show host? I cannot give you an answer which says that do this, 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 and you'll become a talk show host or a good radio jockey for that matter. I mean, I did eight years of radio. There is no, I, there's no advice I can give you on how you can be a radio jockey, but there are things I can tell you that you need to have. For instance, research. It's so important to research who you are talking to. But then when you actually start that conversation, the research has to be on the on the back end. It's just got to be a part of your of your headspace. Like you know all of these things, but everything doesn't need to come out. You let mm-hmm. you know you let the person whom you're talking to lead the conversation and and riff off that. Keep it as entered. And of course, but know very clearly, like for instance, you for instance, I, I got a compliment. You know, you know you've got certain things that you want to ask me. But you're not stopping me at some point in time. Tell me, oh, okay, now, you know, so if I, for instance, I always joke about this. If I was talking about physics to somebody and in your list of questions, your next question was about uh, art. Mm. You don't instantly go to art. You, you, you have to do a segue where there's a logical reason why we can move from physics to art. Yeah. It cannot be like, why I'm super excited and I'm talking about physics. I'm talking about WWE, for instance, right now. And if you just suddenly ask me, hey, Meer, why don't you sing a song from your album? That's a complete instant disconnect. Like I, I can't, I mean, okay, I could probably do it. Like if you told me now, okay, sing a song from your album. I'd be like, uh, okay, give me a second. Okay, let me remember my space right now. But the point is, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. all of these things will come with experience. You know, you'll mm-hmm. know how to make your guests feel comfortable. You'll know that you can be comfortable. Because yeah. at the end of the day, while I'm a talk show host, right now I'm your guest. This is your mm-hmm. show. You know, if you are comfortable knowing that, hey, this is my show and Mihir Joshi is a guest on my show and you are leading the show and I'm following in a sense, while you're making me feel like I'm leading and you're following what I'm saying, you've got it going on. So, you know, that's that's what I would say. These are the small things I can tell somebody who's wanting to create content. But the most important thing is experience and time. You've Mm. got to put in the time. You cannot all of a sudden decide that, hey, I'm going to start off a talk show from now on and get the best guests start with the people that you know get interesting people from your like I, I, a lot of young people i tell them find interesting people from your college or just search on instagram there might be a singer somewhere who is really really good get his story out you know don't expect that on your first episode you're going to get sonu nigam you know you can work up to sonu nigam but it may take you five years you know where, till to the point where you know you've created enough content where sonu nigam looks at your content and says that oh man this is gr- good stuff i'd love to be I, I'd love to have a conversation with him. So mm. yeah, that's, that, that's the, that's, the uh, that's very basic. inspiring advice. And I think that's extremely practical. Also cutting out the question where I ask you to sing. Um, <laughs> 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 how do you create those multiple opportunities using your strengths? How do you put yourself in that position? Because I noticed that um, you, you've been in the media space in, in at various levels. Uh, you've also yeah. been a singer for an in-audio, in-studio experience at uh, IPL Extra Innings. Indeed. So how many of these opportunities were inbound uh, that came to you because of, you know, that experience and that time that you'd put in? Um, yeah. And how many of these were outbound where you actively seeked something that you wanted to sort of put in your portfolio? So uh, literally everything that I have done has been me looking for that opportunity. Mm. Uh, Very few things have just landed up in my lap. Uh, Coincidentally, uh, WWE was one of those things which came to me rather than me going to it. And that was again because of experience because um, uh, there was a radio jockey. He's, I think of him as a very dear friend, like a brother, an older brother who's sort of looked out for me uh, and a mentor of sorts. Uh, He's one of the top radio jockeys in, in Mumbai. 
Rishikesh Kannan and the guy I spoke about, the guy who was kind of doing all the events in WWE was a good friend of his because WWE used to advertise on Radio 1. Hmm. So he asked him, you know what, hey man, we're going to be doing this event and we need like an MC who can come and host it. And, you know, Rishi knew me well because of my years in radio and him knowing me and he knew that I'm a wrestling fan. So he said, you know what, me, you know, just don't think about anybody else. I know the right person for it. You just trust me on this. So he vouched for me and that meant a lot to me because in my career of almost 17 years, I can't think of three people who've just helped me or, you know, I can't think of yeah, literally, I can't think of three people who've just said, okay, you know what? Hey, uh, here's, uh, you know, here's somebody you should go and meet. And I think it'll be good for you. Like, you know, I've had to figure my way out. My wife always jokes about this, that, you know, I'm the, the, like the legitimate OG hustler in, <laughs> in the city, you know, like I figured my way out. Like, I've interviewed over 600 artists now. I mean, I look back mm -hmm. at it in my years of radio plus my years of the MJ show. And I don't think a single of single artist had been just presented to me on a platter. Like I'm talking about the, the big names. Mm -hmm. Now I've come to a point where PR agencies and ma artist managers and even artists themselves reach out to me saying, hey, we've got a new song coming out. Can we come on your show and talk about it? So this is, again, after years of of me hustling that I've come to a point where artists are approaching me and saying, Hey, we've got new content coming out. We'd love to come and talk about it on your show. But at the start, uh, my first interview ever on radio was with Engelbert Humperdinck. Uh, mm -hmm. That blew my mind. Like, uh, so Engelbert is from the, uh, you know, the era of singers who I grew up listening to. So you're Dean Martin, Nat King Cole, uh, Frank Sinatra, Elvis. Oh, wow. So he's, he's one of those legendary guys. He was 70 years old when he came to India. And when he, when I knew that he's coming to India, I said, man, I have to figure out a way to meet him. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I've got to figure out a way to meet him. And I had just begun doing radio. So I put things together. I went to the radio station. I said, listen, man, this is one of the legend, you know, the most legendary guys. He's coming to India. He's performing. I'd love to interview him. And then I told those guys, hey, this is the only radio station playing English music. Why don't you advertise about the show here? So I got business from them to the radio station. Radio station said, go ahead and do the interview. And all I wanted to do is I wanted to get in a room with Engelbert and say, hello, sir. I really appreciate what you've done. I love the music that you've done. And then whilst doing that, I actually got work done as well. That was my first interview ever. Wow. And it was great. I mean, it was a phenomenal feeling to be able to do that. And he loved it. And that for me was the biggest thing. Like this is a man who was 70 years old, who's probably done 10,000 interviews, at least in his life. Midway through my interview, he stops me and says, Meher, I'm really impressed with the research that you've done, the kind of questions you're asking. Because, you know, generally when international celebrities come to India, the questions are like, hey, how do you find chicken tikka masala? Have you tried the food over here? You know, it's and yeah. none of my questions were about that. My questions were about him and his music. So again, like mm -hmm. I said, the research part of it, I'd done my bit and he said it was great. And for me, that was such an amazing thing. That made me realize that if I can talk to Engelbert, I can talk to anybody. And since then, I've literally figured out a way to reach out to everyone. So whether it's with my interviews or it's with events that I've hosted or various other opportunities, I had to figure my way out. And there is no uh, template for that. There is no way mm -hmm. I can teach anybody how to be a hustler. You just have to figure it out. Like if you know that there's something you want to do, you got to figure out how to make it happen. It's not easy. It's not been easy. Uh, it's not easy today. And it was definitely not easy 17 years ago when I began my journey, but yeah. I figured it out. So yeah, that's, that's honestly the God's truth. You know what I mean? I've had to figure my way out through this entire journey of mine. Does everyone need to do that? Or is that just the way, you know, is that the way the industry is constructed where people need to uh, go out there and constantly hustle? Like, what does that teach you personally? So, Unless you are super duper connected in some way, it all comes down to connections in the entertainment industry. And, and you know what? I understand that. I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I don't have a problem with the, con you know, the way the thing is constructed. I'll tell you why. Because um, there are very few jobs uh, in the space. Like if you wanted to be a radio jockey, if you want to be a radio DJ, if you want to be a WWE commentator, or you want to do, a, you want to do commentary for, for cricket or football or whatever, there are hundreds and thousands of people who may want to do it, who may mm -hmm. think that they can do it, but there are literally going to be 10 people who will get that space. It's not like, you know, once you finish engineering and you know, there are, okay, let's, let's, let's do simple mathematics. Let's say that there are a thousand colleges in, in India. There are probably more than a thousand colleges, but let's say there are a thousand colleges and every year, a hundred students graduate out of that. Mm 
All right. So that's thousand into hundred. That's that's the number of students who've gotten out of engineering and they all want a job. There are easily that many number of jobs, or okay, maybe not that many, not hundred thousand jobs, but there are at least eighty five thousand jobs which are there. And then some of them will want to go study abroad, get an MBA, get an MS, and then find another job in their space. And those jobs are available. But in in India, in the entertainment space, if you wanted a job, there are so few jobs, and th- it's not like there is a, a recycle that happens every year. Like if you're a radio jockey, you're probably a radio jockey for twenty years, ten years, fifteen years. There's no such thing like okay, you know what? Now he's done. I think let's let's get somebody else. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're good at what you do, you could mm-hmm. be doing it for a very very long time. So who takes that space? There is nobody else to take the space that you've created for yourself. So if somebody is going to get that space. they need to be really good so connections help you to a point they open the door and your hustle helps you to a point where you know you found out the connect you found out the right person that you want to talk to but at the end of the day it comes down to your talent you mm. got to like i said the hustle part is required if you don't have connections right mm. like if if my father was some really big movie star mm. or if he was a massive music musician mm. maybe my entry into the world of music would have been easier maybe i would have been singing bollywood songs right now and making a ton of money doing hindi music or i would have uh, if if somebody uh, if a big sports person was my father maybe getting a job doing commentary in that particular sport because i would have seen that sport all my life mm-hmm. i would have breathed and lived that sport like if it was cricket or football or whatever for me to be able to do commentary in that would have been relatively easy and he may have been able to open the door for me but at the end of the day i still have to go through that door i'd have to audition i'd have to show my worth because no matter how important my father is if i could not do the job it would end over there you know i would be entertained for maybe a few months but at the at the end of the day they would be like man this guy stinks i don't care who his father is he's got to go mm-hmm. so you know it's about hustle it's about connections but at the end of the day it's about your confidence and your ability to be able to do said job you know so yeah, yeah but i think it is it is something that everybody has to figure out nobody is going to get it easy i keep telling people that if you're going to get into the entertainment space uh, whichever aspect you know whether it's sports or entertainment be ready to struggle for a long long time very few people luck out like one out of a thousand people would be like you know hey i was just sitting in a mall and somebody just spotted me and now here i am i've become an actor in a bollywood film that just doesn't happen like, yeah. that really really doesn't happen mm. so yeah thank you for joining the dots between hustle connection and um and talent uh, extremely yeah. important and very profound uh now i want to just take some advice uh for aspiring commentators aspiring hosts out there uh, while yeah. a lot has been spoken about during the conversation but um from a sports properties perspective what do mm-hmm. they specifically look for i know this may differ for the different sports as you mentioned but Correct. if you could probably classify them into a few skills that sports properties a team or a league would look for in a good host so the first thing like i told you has to be knowledge of said sport you know whether it's wrestling it's cricket it's football it's hockey whatever sport you're talking about you must be if not an expert in it like see you don't need to know how to play the sport but you need to know the the details of the sport you need to know if you're doing cricket commentary you should be able to tell the difference between a square cut and a front long drive or whatever i'm not i'm not the biggest cricket fan as you can evidently make out but yeah what i mean to say is you need to be able to know the difference between you know who's fielding in the slips and who's fielding at mid on so similarly with every sport you need to know the sport very well i think the greatest example of somebody who is not a sports person who is one of the greatest commentators of the sport is harsha bogle for instance mm. he is not like sunil gavaskar or uh, you know somebody who's played the sport for you know for decades and you know who knows the sport inside out as a player but you know when you hear him speak you know that he knows the sport you know that he knows what he is talking about and i think that's what's that's the first thing so knowledge of the sport is tremendously important the second thing is your ability to be a storyteller uh, you know and that's essential in any sport you are not just there to do like i said earlier a play by play because that is the most basic way basic form of uh, commentary or anchoring like you know you you see something and you call it but how do you see something and connect your audience to a bigger picture how do you make them uh, think about more than what they are just seeing if you can mm-hmm. do that that makes you interesting third thing is 
your confidence like you need to exude confidence and you know people need to believe that hey man when this guy talks if you make a mistake as well you should be able to own up to that mistake with confidence like and anybody can make a mistake on any given day but that doesn't mean that you know you lose your confidence after you've made one mistake you know how to handle that aspect of it as well but you need to be confident and i think the final thing is uh, a good voice Hmm. i cannot stress how important that is because uh, and when i say a good voice i don't just mean like a great baritone voice it doesn't really matter if you have the deepest most baritone voice for a man or you know you have the most beautiful uh, you know melodious voice for a female commentator it's about how do you use your voice uh, do you use it well enough that your the 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 inflections of your tone the the ability for your Uh, you know ability to modulate your voice can that also give a second layer of the story apart from the, the you know the knowledgeable content that you will let people know can your voice excite people mm. is your voice memorable is that something that's going to stay in somebody's mind way after they finished watching that show is that voice still stuck in somebody's head i think that again comes with practice you know mm. it's not something that is automated automated you know you do you can have a great voice but you still need to know how to use it well yeah. um i'll give you an example from a radio perspective yeah i used to do when i was doing radio i used to do a morning slot i used to do the afternoon and i've done the late nights now my voice had to be different not just in these three slots hmm. but these three slots were three hour slots so my voice from hour 1 to hour 3 had to be different wow. because in a, in my morning show i'd start at 6 a.m. Mm-hmm. at 6 am if somebody is screaming in your ears you're going to be annoyed right Damn. you want somebody to start the day with hey good morning ladies and gentlemen my name is mehir joshi i'm going to be playing you some really beautiful songs uh let's start it off with this song so you know that's my voice by the time i'm i'm at 9 am you know when people are in their car they're going to the office i want to be like hey man this is fantastic did you just you know we just heard the biggest new song right now by justin bieber and now let's go into so you know what my voice changed if i'm starting my late night slot at 10 o'clock it's about this level but maybe a little lower because you know by the time it's 10 o'clock people still want exciting music but you know they are at home you know they're not in a traffic jam they're not really like you know a high wire you know uh, uh, you know they want it to be a little muted compared to the morning or evening slot mm-hmm. and by the time i went to my midnight hour it would be back to my 6 a.m voice it would be this the sweet deeper voice where i'm closer to the microphone i'm talking to you, you I'm, i'm right in your ear and you can hear me say You know what? Let's listen to a, this. Listen to this beautiful song by Bing Crosby. I think uh, it's a song that I heard in this movie, and it was really, really beautifully done. Mm. I, I'm not getting into the specifics of it. I'm just talking about the the voice. Yeah. Did you see? You know, just moving closer to a microphone, knowing how you can use your voice, from sitting here and talking to you, and then being able to do this. If I can connect with you in a more intimate way at midnight, make you feel like. and i'm not being sensual or shit and nothing like that mm-hmm. i'm playing good old stuff i mean i used to be playing songs from the 30s to the 60s at this point of time mm-hmm. but i wanted it to be an intimate feeling where you know somebody is putting on their headphones at 12 in the night when the rest of the house is asleep or you know they're driving back home in their car it's a very relaxed thing i cannot be screaming in their faces yeah. so if i can do that if i can make people feel different things with my voice and not just my content that is important so these few things that i talked about these are just the basics that i can tell you that these are the things that you have to figure out you know with with time and with experience and you realize that okay ha huh, my midnight voice has to be different from my 5 pm voice or you know when you're doing commentary my commentary that i would do for a chess game which is a mm-hmm. more intimate game would be very different from a wwe commentary game like uh, everybody right now watched uh, what was that show on netflix about chess uh, the queen's you gambit yeah queen's gambit thank you for helping me out with that i have the worst memory i mean i'm telling you i keep joking about the fact that i remember like some random things out of the blue and i forget everything else and i always say my wife is my external hard drive <laughs> she knows everything so she'll she'll tell me what i'm missing as my long as as long as you remember all the facts for wwe i think that's that's good enough right <laughs> absolutely <laughs> so i was saying in in the queen's gambit when they are doing commentary or you know you're hearing the guys talk about a chess game you see the way that entire voice is that's not the same voice that you would hear in uh, if you go back to that same era 1960s 70s whenever it was and if you watch a wrestling match that's not the voice that you would hear from the commentators 
doing wrestling commentary compared mm-hmm. to the guys who are doing chess commentary so you got to know what what sport you are doing the commentary for and use your voice intelligently to connect with that audience and mm-hmm. i think that's that's the basic advice i can give for young people who want to get into the space no that's that's amazing um you you listen to uh, these amazing hosts but you never kind of um, pay attention to how they've differentiated their voice you know during different times of the day uh, the shows hosted or maybe different properties in that sense yeah. so thank you for laying that out um lastly what is next for you with the mj show and uh, other things that uh, you can obviously reveal so you know uh, the mj show has been uh, i think my it's been the the pride and joy of my life you know i mean i've done a lot of interesting things in my life but the one thing that i'm most proud of and honestly speaking i see myself doing for the next 25 years is the mj show wow. I, i like i told you i turned 40 right now i want to be like david letterman or jay leno or uh, you know uh, you know uh, larry king who were right in their 60s 70s or whatever it was uh, and they were still doing interesting conversations i genuinely love doing the mj show i mean i don't do it because of whatever reasons you know it's not just a thing you know it's not just my ability you know my need to meet people or you know connect with people i enjoy having these conversations i am realizing now that people enjoy having these conversations with me they want to come and talk to me and you know the i keep joking about it you know it's not like every episode of mine has thousands and millions of views you know mm-hmm. they don't uh, the reality of youtube is that you could create the greatest content in the world but you know unless you are spending some money and promoting that content or uh, at least to begin with it's not like it's going to instantly go viral especially if it's it's just a great conversation you know uh, if there's something that creates that virality if you have got something crazy or gimmicky it could go viral but if it's a great conversation it's not necessary that it will have thousands and millions of views but despite that literally everybody in the entertainment industry wants to come and talk to me on my show so i feel that i've got something right that's going on since the 30th of march last year uh, uh, i think about 8 days after lockdown officially happened in india in, in india and in mumbai since then till today i've had over 200 guests different guests on the mj show so this has been an incredible year and i want to end it maybe at the end of this month and put some time figure out how i can make it even better and come back with season 8 of the mj show so my goal right now is while this has been a fairly successful youtube property i want to figure out how can we make it even bigger like i said if i want to be doing it for the next 25 years i have to make it so that it becomes a sustainable property which is also creating um, uh, you know which is also a source of income for me it can't just be a passion project it's also got to be my main business and that's what i intend to do uh, this year with the mj show and the other thing i can tell you is i'm very excited i'm going to be releasing my first hindi single this year Oh wow. So my, the music that I've released so far was in English. It was an album called Mumbai Blues yep. uh, which was released about 6 years ago. But I'm never release original Hindi content and I'm going to be doing that this year and I'm fortunate that I get to do it with somebody I deeply admire. I've been a fan of this man since my teenage years. Uh, I'm talking about Leslie Lewis who used to be a part of the Colonial Cousins band and mm. of course he's got his own independent music and he's essentially been I'd say in a way the the godfather of indian pop music back in the day some of the biggest pop bands they all have worked with him and i, I being a western singer yeah. i knew that i needed somebody who understands a western singer but who also translates brilliantly in hindi and he is the definition of that like he's got great hindi songs but it feels like it's an english song you know it, i mean musically and melodically it feels like oh this this could be an english song but he sings amazing content in hindi and i get to work with him so i'm super excited about that uh, that should happen hopefully in the next few months so yeah those are two things that i'm really excited about taking the mj show to the next level and uh, uh, you know releasing my hindi single and along with that of course my wwe commentary work yeah. will continue i'll complete 3 years as a commentator like i told you on the 24th of april so i'm looking forward to that that sort of milestone as well yeah amazing you got a um, very busy year ahead of you um but it was uh, great listening to you i personally learned so much because this was obviously somewhat like a boot camp um on on commentary on hosting on hustling um thank you for <laughs> connecting all those dots and uh, really appreciate your time thank you so much 
Hey, glad I could be here. Thank you very much uh, for having me as a guest. I, I got to tell you, I, I, I have done a fair amount of conversations, but I've talked about a lot of things today, which I've never spoken about before. So for me also, it was very interesting that uh, I, I, you got all of these things out of me. And uh, I really enjoyed talking to you and I, I wish you all the very best. I hope uh, you keep making a lot more uh, a lot more episodes like this and getting out great conversations from your guests means a lot coming from you truly thank you so much you're very welcome thank you everybody for tuning in please don't forget to subscribe like and share for the best tips and trends in the world of sports business wherever you listen to podcasts reach out over social media to connect or collaborate links will be in the bio see you next time